Okay, so our next uh, discussion is with uh, medications or antineoplastics that block cellular division. So I want to go back to uh, the first big picture uh, slide. So here, um, let's say that we've made, uh, we've blocked uh, nucleotides, we've blocked the building blocks, uh, we've blocked some uh, DNA replication. Uh, now, let's say that you weren't able to block these things, that you weren't able to block nucleotides or you weren't able to block uh, DNA and you've made DNA and the cell now uh, wants to uh, divide, it wants to undergo mitosis. Uh, so you can give these medications that are specific to the M phase uh, to block cellular division. So that's uh, what we're going to talk about uh, now. So I just wanted to give a little bit of a background uh, on how cells divide and move, because this is, uh, believe it or not, this is a high yield topic that comes into um, other pharmacology uh, sections and it comes into biochemistry too. So cells use uh, microtubules, which are composed of a helix uh, of uh, these things, alpha and beta tubulin. So one alpha tubulin comes together with one beta tubulin and makes uh, heterodimers. And these heterodimers polymerize together um, and make a microtubule. So this is a structure of microtubule and this is taken from first aid. Um, and microtubules are incorporated into flagella, uh, cilia, and, mito and mitotic uh, spindles. And they're involved in a bunch of things. Um, and based on whatever they're involved, uh, we can target uh, we can target that process. So the first thing that they're involved in is in mitosis. So you can target uh, the spindles in mitosis by uh, the vinca alkaloids and the taxanes, and you can use it to stop cell division. So you can block. Uh, uh, you can use it as anti-cancer drugs. Uh, they're also used for white blood cell extravasation. So if there is inflammation and the white blood cells need to go to the area of, uh, of inflammation, and I'm pretty sure you guys have learned about this in pathology, um, uh, white blood cells use also micro uh, microtubules. So we we can use that clinically uh, in anti-gout uh, medication, colchicine, uh, because in gout you have inflammation um, that's produced by the white blood cells, and colchicine kind of blocks the movement of the white blood cells into the area of inflammation. Uh, it's also microtubules are used in sperm or cilia movement. Uh, they're used in exoplasmic transport, so transport of material along the axon. Um, and fungus and worms actually use it to move. Um, so we can use it clinically uh, to block movements of uh, fungus and worms um, by using antifungals like griseofulvin uh, and antihelminthic, uh, which is mebendazole. Um, and they actually use it for, uh, for uh, mitosis too. Um, so that's the basic idea of how cells uh, divide uh, and move. So moving into the using that clinically. So there is uh, two classes of medications that are that block the uh, the microtubules. So these are the vinca alkaloids and the taxanes. So the vinca alkaloids. The first one is vinblastine and vincristine. So the mechanism of action is that it binds the beta tubulin and inhibits its polymerization. Um, so the beta tubulin can't polymerize with the alpha tubulin, um, th thus uh, you can't make mitotic uh, spindle formation. If you can't make mitotic spindle formation, uh, the cells can't uh, divide. Uh, again, it works specifically in the M phase, and this is a high yield point because test examiners will ask you uh, which phase of the cell cycle it works in. Um, use um, vincristine, it can be used for Hodgkin's, uh, vinblastine, it's used for metastatic testicular tumors, uh, but this is not as uh, of a high yield point. Uh, side effects is actually a high yield point. So vinblastine, uh, it's, uh, we say it blasts the bone marrow, so it causes bone marrow suppression, vinblastine. Uh, vincristine, it causes peripheral neuropathy. And if you think about the mechanism of peripheral neuropathy will actually make sense uh, because these are cells that inhibit um, transport of material through the axon, right? So the cell needs to move uh, things from, uh, like wastes from one part of the, uh, of the neuron to the other. Uh, if you give that medication, vincristine, uh, the cells can't really move it. So you're going to end up with damage to the axon. So you'll get areflexia, 
So you're not going to get reflexes from the patient and you'll get peripheral neuritis uh, and constipation because you can't transmit the signal to the gastrointestinal tract. So this is the uh, Vinca alkaloids. The second uh, uh, class of, uh, of agents is the taxanes. So this is paclitaxel and docetaxels. And the mechanism of action is that they hyperstabilize uh, the polymerized microtubules. So the cell uh, needs to make uh, microtubules, but eventually they have to break them, right? Uh, so paclitaxel and docetaxels, they actually hyperstabilize the microtubules in the M phase. So the mitotic spindles can't break down and the cells can divide. Um, there is one point that I really want to stress, and this will become a very, very high yield point for examinations, whether it's block exams or whether it's step one exam, is to know the difference in the mechanism of action between both. And it's something that's very high yield. So uh, the vinblastine and vincristine, they inhibit inhibit polymerization of the microtubules. Again, they inhibit the polymerization. On the other side, paclitaxel and docetaxels, they hyperstabilize the polymerized microtubules. So very, very important that you understand the difference, understand and know the difference between uh, both of these uh, classes of medications. Um, the taxanes are used for ovarian and breast cancer, and side effects, they can cause hypersensitivity reactions, uh, myelosuppression, and neuropathy. Uh, and again, please know the difference in the mechanism of action between, uh, between both. Um, this slide was sort of a cheap shot uh, from me, uh, just looking over previous exams uh, and the things that were, uh, the chemo regimens that were tested for previous exams. Um, if you have a couple extra neurons that you want to spend, um, you know, look over them, and uh, uh, if you want to memorize them, uh, they m they might show up on your block exam, but I don't think they're uh, very high yield for uh, for step exam. Um, and that concludes our section with agents that divide uh, that block uh, cellular division. All right, guys, we're back and uh, we're finishing our uh, discussion with the antineoplastic agents. Um, I hope that you had a chance to kind of digest what we talked about before with the um, uh, anti-metabolites and the anti uh, and the alkylating agents. Um, and next, we're going to talk about uh, kind of other stuff, so hormonal agents, monoclonal antibodies, and uh, specific uh, specific uh, cancer drugs. Um, so our our discussion right now, we're going to start with hormonal agents. And the whole idea about hormonal agents is that every cancer cell uh, really needs a signal to proliferate. Whether the signal is a hormone, whether the signal is um, a specific overexpressed molecule, uh, but uh, every cancer cell needs a signal. And the idea be behind hormonal uh, agents is that you're blocking this signal, so you're blocking the proliferation of the cells. So as I, as always, I kind of like to start with a big picture uh, overview um, of what we're doing. So there's um, estrogen dependent tissues and then there's androgen dependent tissue. The estrogen dependent tissue, it's either breast or endometrium um, or bone. So if you have extra estrogen in the breast, you can have breast cancer. If you have extra estrogen in the endometrium, you can have endometrial cancer. Uh, now with bone, uh, Estrogen deficiency, if you have low estrogen, you can uh, have osteoporosis. And this is something that you guys probably already know from first year physiology. So that's as far as the estrogen. As far as the androgen, uh, the androgen dependent tissues is really the biggest thing uh, that we're going to talk about pharmacologically is the prostate. So uh, if you have extra androgen, you can have uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia or you can have prostate cancer. So that's with the big picture. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, breast, uh, and specifically breast cancer. And for breast cancer, you can have, um, they kind of classify breast cancer into uh, immunohistological staining. So that means, what is actually the cancer cells uh, express? Do they express estrogen receptors? So if they express estrogen receptors, we can call them estrogen positive or estrogen negative. Do they express progesterone receptors? Uh, receptors, And if that's the case, then it could be positive or negative. And the last thing uh, is HER2 nu, which is a tyrosine uh, kinase receptor. And I'm pretty sure you guys have heard about it as well, whether it's from CMCB or from previous classes. And uh, the classification is, is it positive or negative? Uh, 
And the reason for this classification is that we can treat uh, breast cancer based on these uh, based on these receptors. Now, um, specifically, we're going to talk about estrogen receptive positive breast cancer. So the goal is to really block uh, estrogen. So we can do it in two different ways. We can block estrogen directly, so that's using the drug called tamoxifen, or we can block the androgen conversion to estrogen. So as we know that some of the uh, estrogen comes from androgen conversion, and these are by the aromatase inhibitors. So that's as far as breast and breast cancer. As far as uh, androgens uh, specifically, and specifically prostate cancer, so the whole goal is to block, uh, to block androgens. And how do we block androgens? We can block the whole axis. So you know how androgens come from gonadotropin-releasing hormone uh, that makes FH or LSH. Um, and uh, these uh, go and make androgens. So you can block the whole axis by uh, these two medications, luprolide or gosrolin, or you can block the testosterone conversion to dihydroxy, dihydro uh, I think it's dihydroxy, uh, DHT, um, which is the active component of, uh, of, of, uh, of androgens. And the way to do it is by flutamide. So that's kind of like the big picture of, of what exactly we're doing. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the estrogen modifiers or inhibitors. So the first drug uh, is tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is a, tamoxifen is a very high yield uh, drug and I would actually pay a particular attention to it. So how it works is that um, it's an estrogen receptor modulator. What does that mean? It means that it modulates um, estrogen, uh, estrogen response at the receptor. So it's kind of funky. It works, um, it can't really can't make up its mind when I think about tamoxifen. In the breast, it's an antagonist to estrogen. So in the breast, when estrogen comes in, it blocks it. But in the bone and endometrium, it's actually an agonist. So uh, it uh, stimulates the estrogen receptor. Um, it's used for uh, ER positive breast cancer. So estrogen, the breast cancer cells that express estrogen receptor. And the reason for that is that it's an antagonist in the breast tissue. Uh, the side effects for it is dependent on the mechanism. So if we know that it's an agonist in the bone and in the endometrium tissue, so we know that it's going to go into the endometrium and it's going to uh, be an agonist. So that will cause endometrial carcinoma. So we know that the I think you guys will study uh, that in pathology a little bit later when it comes to the repro uh, section, that uh, endometrial tissue is dependent uh, on estrogen and extra estrogen causes endometrial carcinoma. So tamoxifen, because it's an agonist in the endometrium, causes endometrial carcinoma. The other thing that's important is that it causes thromboembolic events. What do I mean by that? So thromboembolic events, whether it's a deep venous thrombos, thrombosis, whether it's in the deep uh, veins of the leg or if it's a pulmonary embolism. And the reason for that is because estrogen increases the clotting factor synthesis by the liver. So if you have extra clotting factors, you're going to have extra clotting and that is going to cause thromboembolic uh, events. And lastly, it causes uh, hot flashes, which is related directly to the estrogen. So if I would remember anything from tamoxifen, it would probably the effect that it's antagonist in the breast and agonist in the bone and endometrium, and it causes endometrial carcinoma and thromboembolic events uh, and hot flashes. Uh, second, uh, estrogen uh, modifiers or inhibitors are the aromatase inhibitors. So these are anestrozole, letrozole, and exemestane. And how they work is that they inhibit aromatase enzyme. Um, and you guys probably already know what's aromatase enzyme. It's an enzyme that is responsible for the peripheral conversion of androgens to estrogen. So uh, aromatase enzyme makes uh, estrogen. And it's used for these drugs, anestrozole, letrozole, and eczemestane. It's used for ER positive breast cancer in postmenopausal women. And you're going to ask me why specifically in postmenopausal women. And I'll tell you that the source of estrogen is different uh, whether uh, patients are premenopausal or postmenopausal. So premenopausal women, the source of estrogen is ovaries. But in postmenopausal women, the source of estrogen is peripheral conversion by aromatase. So that's why anestrozole, letrozole, and eczema stain uh, 
are used for breast cancer in postmenopausal women. So that's as far as estrogen uh, modifiers. Uh, next is androgen uh, inhibitors. So as we talked about, we have uh, luprolides and gosrolin, which are gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs. So what does that mean? So these uh, are pretty much similar in action to gonadotropin releasing hormone, as if you're giving uh, GnRH. And um, and I think you guys remember from, uh, or if you remember, or, or if you don't remember, we'll review it. But it depends on how it's used, whether it's used in pulsatile fashion or if it's used in continuous fashion. So if it's used in pulsatile fashion, it's an agonist. Um, but if it's used continuously, it's an antagonist because it downregulates the gonadotropin releasing hormone receptors in the pituitary and leads to decreased FSH and LH. So in the setting of prostate cancer where we need to decrease androgen, it's actually used continuously. So we give it to the patients all the time and it acts as an antagonist. It's used for prostate adenocarcinoma. Uh, as I mentioned, it decreases LH and that decreases uh, androgens. And it has some other indications that we're not gonna talk about it now uh, and it come up in the endocrine section. Um, side effects is that you can have a transient disease flare in the initial treatment. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, you remember, you are using uh, gonadotropin-releasing hormones. So first, uh, the body's going to think that you're giving an agonist. So it's going to make some luteinizing hormone, and luteinizing hormone is going to make some androgen. So you're going to have some disease flare. But eventually, the receptors are going to be down-regulated, um, and it's going to decrease uh, LH and eventually uh, androgen. So it causes a transient disease flare, and it's treated with uh, flutamide, which uh, brings me to flutamide. So what is flutamide? Um, flutamide is a non-steroidal uh, competitive inhibitor at the DHT receptor. So androgen comes in um, and gets converted to DHT. Uh, DHT wants to go and bind to the receptor uh, to kind of make its action, but flutamide uh, blocks it, and it's used for prostate uh, adenocarcinoma. So that's as far as the estrogen and the, uh, and the androgens. Uh, our next discussion is going to talk about uh, monoclonal uh, antibodies. So the idea behind monoclonal antibodies is that you have a signal uh, that's going to the cancer cells and uh, this signal is making the cancer cell grow. Uh, so we've identified this, this signal and we can block it by, a, uh, by an antibody. So we have different drugs here. Uh, trastuzumab, rituximab, cetuximab, uh, bevacizumab, and bortezomib. Um, and these are kind of uh, important because uh, test uh, makers like to test you on what is it actually blocks and um, um, because it's, it's kind of new. So trastuzumab um, is uh, a medication for breast cancer. So it blocks HER2 new. So we already talked that breast cancer can be HER2 new positive. Um, and HER2 new is a tyrosine kinase uh, receptor. So it blocks HER2 new. So TRES2 is a map. Um, it's used for HER2 new positive breast cancer um, and side effects that can cause cardiotoxicity. Uh, next monoclonal antibody is rituximab. Uh, rituximab blocks CD20. So do you guys remember where CD20 uh, receptor is found? Yes, it's on all uh, B cells. So B cells have CD19 and CD20, um, and uh, rituximab blocks CD20 on, uh, on B cells. So B cell can have uh, neoplasms, whether uh, it's uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or um, or um, uh, or other or other lymphomas. Uh, so it blocks uh, it blocks CD20. Um, so it's used for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and chronic myeloid leukemia. Um, and side effects is that it can cause infusion-related reactions. So when the patients get the infusion, they can get like hypertension, rash, and uh, things like that. Um, the third monoclonal antibody is cetuximab, um, and cetuximab blocks uh, EGFR. So EGFR is an epidermal growth factor receptor, um, and uh, cetuximab blocks it, and it's used for stage 4 colon cancer. Uh, next monoclonal antibody is bevacizumab. Uh, 
Um, and bevacizumab uh, blocks uh, VEGF. So VEGF is a vascular endothelial growth factor. Um, so if you guys remember, that's the growth factor that's responsible for angiogenesis, which means uh, new blood vessels. Um, it's used for solid tumors, uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, because uh, in diabetic retinopathy, you have a lot of uh, blood vessels and then also in macular degeneration. Side effect, as you would expect, if you have a drug that inhibits um, angiogenesis, you're going to inhibit blood flow, and if you inhibit blood flow, you're going to impair the wound healing. Uh, and lastly, um, last uh, medication, it's not a monoclonal antibody, but it's a biologic. It's called bortezomib, and bortezomib is a proteasome inhibitor. So if you guys remember, what is a proteasome? So if from cell bio, uh, if you remember, proteasomes are these uh, cell machinery that degrades damaged ubiquitin-tagged proteins. So this is a big, big, big uh, buzzword, very high yield for examination, um, that ubiquitin-tagged proteins go to the proteasomes and proteasomes uh, degrade it. Now, if you give a drug uh, that inhibit the proteasome, you're going to have a lot of damaged proteins, and that's going to eventually lead to cell apoptosis. So that's a very uh, high yield, not so much for the block exam, but for step one, there are so many questions on proteasomes and pro proteasome inhibitors, um, and it's used for uh, multiple myeloma. So if I want to focus on anything on the monoclonal antibodies, I would know what is it exactly blocks. Trastuzumab blocks HER2 new, rituximab blocks CD20, cetuximab blocks EGFR, bevacizumab blocks uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, and bortezomib blocks uh, proteasome. So that's as far as the monoclonal antibodies. Um, next, we're going to, uh, this is actually our final section of the, um, uh, or the final section that I'm going to discuss with the antineoplastics is the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So I know that you guys have probably studied this in CNCB, um, and this is pretty much going to be a review for you guys. So what is tyrosine, uh, tyrosine kinase? So tyrosine kinase is, an inf uh, is a um, cell signal, uh, pretty much, that allows the cell to, uh, to grow, if I want to say it in very simple words. Um, and we have identified, uh, well, not, not me, but scientists have identified um, specific cancers that have high expression in uh, tyrosine kinase. So the idea is to block the uh, signaling of these tyrosine kinase and block cancer growth. So the first uh, medication that's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor is imatinib. Uh, so imatinib uh, is uh, used specifically for uh, chronic myeloid leukemia. And the reason for that is that it's specific for BCR-able tyrosine kinase, which is Philadelphia chromosome. Um, you guys will probably have the lymphoid neoplasm sections, um, and you'll talk about chronic myeloid leukemia. But the one thing that I want you to know for now is that imatinib is used specifically for BCR-ABLE, um, and it's used for chronic myeloid leukemia. Very, very, very high yield. Uh, if you know this, I'll get you a lot of points on, uh, on uh, block exams and um, on step. Uh, other uh, low yield point is that it's also used for GI stromal tumors, uh, and that uh, it blocks CKIT tyrosine kinase. Side effects, it causes some fluid retention. Uh, next, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors are erlotinib and gefitinib. Uh, so these are epidermal growth factor tyrosine uh, kinase inhibitors, and these are used for non-small cell lung cancers. Um, so if I, want to, if I want you guys to know anything, uh, that it would be imatinib would be, uh, it's used for BCR-able tyrosine kinase uh, for chronic myeloid leukemia, and erlotinib is used for uh, EGFR tyrosine kinase and it's used for non-small cell uh, lung cancer. Uh, the next section uh, Mike is going to talk about is actually some miscellaneous uh, anti-neoplastic. Uh, All right, the home stretch, the last few miscellaneous uh, anti-cancer drugs. So I really wouldn't call this a drug, but more of like a system. So this is something new that they've been doing, and I actually learned about this when I was in pharmacy school about four or five years ago. Not this specific uh, system, but uh, the process.
So what we're doing now is we're taking a patient's T cells, extracting them from their body, and then exposing them to uh, uh, the antigen that we want them to attack. So we could actually take some of their tumor out in the system I learned and expose their T cells to that tumor and then have them be activated and uh, infuse them right back in. So with this specific system, I'm not even going to try to say the name, Tisaglensalucine, Lucil. It is uh, used for uh, ALL and B-cell lymphomas, and it can cause a little bit of a cytokine release syndrome. You really wouldn't worry too much about this slide, but understand that there are systems out there to actually take patients' T cells and expose them to uh, antigens to cause uh, a response, and we can use them to fight cancer. Some other uh, miscellaneous agents, uh, we have L. Uh, asparaginase, which is actually really cool. It's an enzyme that's found in uh, E. coli. And as we know, asparagine is a non-essential amino acid, except in um, some tumor cells. So some tumor cells do not have asparagine synthase, so they cannot make uh, asparagine. So if we give L-asparaginase, we are actually uh, metabolizing all of our asparagine. Now in our normal cells, this is fine because we have asparagine synthase, but in tumor cells, they have no or low levels of asparagine synthase. Therefore, they become displete of uh, L -asparag uh, asparagine and will be uh, destroyed. So uh, it can be used in ALL and it can cause some hypersensitivity. Wouldn't worry too much again about this, just sort of know that system of we're using an enzyme to deplete an amino acid. Hydroxyurea. It inhibits ribonucleotide reductase. It was historically used for CML, but as we know now, for CML we have our uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, Gleevec, or imatinib, to use against the uh, Philadelphia uh, chromosome uh, 922 translocation. But it is still used uh, quite often for sickle cell anemia. Actually, it's almost exclusively used for sickle cell anemia because it can actually increase our fetal hemoglobin and uh, help treat the uh, sickle cell patients with that. It can cause some myelospression. I'm sure you've all heard of uh, thalidomide. So this was the drug that was originally developed for pregnancy-associated morning sickness, but because of a uh, pharmacologist who worked for the FDA, it actually wasn't allowed and approved in the United States. And you know, as you can see from the upper right-hand corner, we didn't have to worry about uh, children developing these uh, horrific uh, birth defects. So, like many drugs, as you'll see throughout the year, the mechanism of action, for whatever reason, is unknown. There are a few postulations right here. Uh, we primarily use thalidomide and lenalidomide for multiple myeloma, and lenalidomide can be used for myelodysplastic syndrome, but I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, thalidomide, is a, as I said previously, was a sedative, so it can be used and can cause you know a little too much of that. And uh, it's also been known to cause peripheral neuropathy, and lenalidomide has been known to cause some leukopenia. Uh, one of our final agents, varinostat, it is a histone deacetylase inhibitor. So we're inhibiting the acetylation, the deacetylation, I'm sorry, of histones. So when acetylated histone is uh, a more relaxed chromatin structure, so it uh, allows for more transcription of cell cycle arrest proteins and cellular apoptosis proteins. It's primarily used for cutaneous T cell lymphomas, and uh, it has some side effects. I wouldn't worry too much about the side effects or the use. I would know that uh, it is a histone deacetylase inhibitor, and that actually leads to an increase in uh, uh, transcription. And then finally, a couple adjuncts that we've actually already spoken about in our earlier lecture on immunosuppressants. So it's sort of an anticlimactic ending to one of the harder uh, subjects in cancer, one of the subjects I think is probably the hardest in cancer in uh, pharmacology.